waters are fast moving. Unlike other big rallies, a bit earlier at about 7 a.m., a group from the Coast Guard. Today on Rappler, the former chief of the Technology Resource Center is now a provisional witness for the pork barrel case. Eight months after being kidnapped in Sulu, the Bansil sisters are free. And Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych agrees to an early election to end the crisis. Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. Justice Secretary Laila de Lima provisionally approves the application as state witness of former Technology Resource Center Chief Dennis Cunanan in the plunder cases against senators involved in the pork barrel scam. De Lima says Cunanan's affidavit is, quote, essential and corroborative of whistleblowers' earlier testimonies implicating Senators Jingo Estrada, Juan Ponce Enrile, and Bong Revilla. The three senators and several others are accused of conniving with alleged scam mastermind Janet Limnopoulos in the largest corruption scandal in recent history. De Lima says Cunanan's affidavit is supported by documents like letters of endorsement, project summaries, and memorandums of agreement, or MOAs. De Lima says the MOA shows the senators, quote, endorsed as legitimate and bona fide, the NGOs linked to Napolis. Kunanan applied for admission to the Justice Department's Witness Protection Program in 2013. He is among the 38 charged in the scam. Whistleblower Ben Hur Loy identified Kunanan as one of the officials who got kickbacks from Napolis. A commission on audit report shows 347.91 million pesos in Senator's pork barrel were misused by eight NGOs coursed through the TRC. State witness Ruby Twasson denies allegations she was withholding information on other legislators involved in the pork barrel scam. In a forum held in the Ateneo de Manila University Friday, Twasson says she, quote, feels better after coming clean. I am speaking from the perspective of an individual who had committed such mistakes. But I'm also speaking as someone disturbed by the consequences of those actions. On Friday, on February 7th, Toisson turned herself in to the Justice Department and admitted acting as a middleman for alleged scam mastermind Janet Limnapolis and Senator Jingoy Estrada. Asked why she participated in the scam, Toisson says she was lured by the promise of a 5% commission per transaction. She also denies allegations she's covering up for Senator Juan Ponce Enrile, one of those charged in the pork barrel scam. For our social media post of the day, netizens react to Ruby Toisson's open forum in Ateneo. Some praised her candor, others were skeptical. At Chili Medley tweets, as in all things, tell the truth and things fall into place. At Jay Walker says, here's Mrs. Toisson lauded for her initiative to return the money while we all know it's not hers to keep in the first place. And at Ao Pijuan asks, I wonder if Ruby Toison will be sorry if she wasn't caught. Eight months after they were kidnapped in Sulu by armed men linked to the Abu Sayyaf group, sisters Najwa and Linda Bansil are finally free. Philippine National Police spokesman Theodore Sindak confirms the two women filmmakers, quote, escaped from their kidnappers Thursday. Rappler sources say the Abu Sayyaf was forced to free the sisters after a series of military operations in the area. They were found in Sitio Cantatang Buhanginan in Patikul Sulu by the Marines. The Bansil sisters were working on an independent film when they were kidnapped in June 2013. They were held hostage for eight months. Classified documents obtained by Rappler show the kidnappers demanded 50 million pesos or nearly $1.2 million in ransom. Graduating cadet Jeff Aldrin Kudia files a counter complaint against nine fellow cadets who were part of the honor committee that decided to sack him from the Philippine Military Academy or PMA. Kudia and his family say the committee dismissed him over what they say was a trivial matter that he was late for two minutes in one class. 
Kudia's sister also said a supposedly rigged voting led to the decision. The cadet finds a new ally in PMA alumnus Dado Enrique, a former member of the Honor Committee and Class Baron of PMA Class 1983. In a Facebook post, Enrique referred to reports that one of the nine Honor Committee members initially voted against Kudia's dismissal. He adds, do not cover up the 8 to 1 that became 9 to 0 and explain to me that it is the current practice. Shame on you all. The PMA defends its decision, saying it excluded Kudia from this year's roster of PMA graduates after their findings showed he violated the honor code. Displaced farmers of Tarlac, Sachenda, Luisita, remember the time they used to till land promised by agrarian reform. Today, they live in makeshift shelters in the wake of the violent demolitions that destroyed what they once called home. Pia Renada reports. Neat lines of tomato plants. Lush rice fields. 36-year-old farmer Rudy Pineda used to tend to crops like these in his farm in Barangay Balete in Hacienda Luisita, Tarlac. But last February 8, guards demolished farmer homes and bulldozed their crops. Now he's building a makeshift house beside the road. Now, Rudy skirts around barbed wire fences, an alien in his own land. Pineda is one of 30 farmers displaced by February demolitions in Hacienda Luisita. The ancestral land of the family of President Benigno Aquino, it is one of the largest pieces of agricultural land being distributed by the Department of Agrarian Reform to 6,000 farmers. Farmers like Pineda used to live on a 300-hectare portion of the land claimed by the Tarlac Development Corporation, or Tadeco. This wall was not here a month ago. It was built by Tadeco around the land they claim, blocking farmers from reaching the crops they have cultivated for years. Elevated guard posts look over the land. Sibayan has only bitter memories of Tadeco guards. Ginibadin yung kubo namin sa gabi. Hindi makareklamo yung mga pamilya namin, pati yung asawa ko, dahil nakatutok yung baril. Parang yung talagang pinulbos nila, pati yung mga maitlog na manok, talagang basag lahat. Tadeco charged the farmers with trespassing, robbery, and direct assault on guards. Tadeco says the guards were merely doing their job in protecting Tadeco's land. The demolitions come four months after the DAR distributed land titles to farmers willing to pay a 30-year amortization for the land. But Sibayan calls the distribution a big sham. She says the farmers shouldn't have to pay for the land. Noon pa, ilang taon na, ilang dekada na, sa dugot pawis namin, nakasyar nga kami. Hanggang ngayon, pati 1.33 billion hindi na pera ng mga magsaka, hindi pa binibigay. Bakit namin babayaran? Bayad na kami! Only remnants of a former life can be found in the places where the farmers once lived. Masagip po sa amin. Ang mawalan ng kabuhay. Parang pinatay na rin mga pamilya ko sa ginawa nila. Piranada, Rappler, Tarlac. San Francisco Mayor Edwin Lee visits Manila, San Francisco's sister city. He meets with Manila Mayor Joseph Estrada and shares his city's lessons on disaster preparedness. Ryan Macasero reports. Manila Mayor Joseph Ejercito Estrada welcomes the mayor of his sister city, San Francisco, with a song. This is San Francisco Mayor Edwin Lee's first trip to the Philippines since he became mayor in 2012. Lee is the first Asian American elected mayor of the city. He led the sister city delegation of government officials, businessmen, and community leaders. The region is home to 450,000 Filipino Americans, but this visit was more than just a courtesy call. In the aftermath of the Super Typhoon Yolanda, we saw images of people of the Philippines coming together to help each other. And this inspired many people of the San Francisco Bay Area 
to give back. And in San Francisco, which is known for its generosity when communities are in need, we're certainly no strangers to natural disasters. San Francisco sits along an active fault zone and is prone to earthquakes. The 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake injured over 3,000 people, killed 57, and caused billions in economic damage. The most important tip from San Francisco, be prepared. A lot of people tend to just kind of put that into background noise. That, eh, it's going to happen. There's not much we can do about it. Well, we believe there is. And we also believe that how we motivate people to change their behavior is more important than what we tell them. In other words, Dudgeon says people prioritize their immediate needs over preparedness, and that's what needs to change. The city recruited social scientists and communication experts to change that culture. The San Francisco Department of Emergency Management uses text messages, emails, Facebook, and Twitter to deliver important life-saving messages to the residents. Is we want to have messages that are, that are very simple, that, 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 are, that, are, that, are, that are in plain speak, that people can understand. And you know, I, I like to boil it down to this. Um, during an emergency, people want to know what's going on, what we're doing about it, and what's going to happen next. Uh, that really boils down to the what, the so what, and now. If you plan for it, if you uh, already identify what things you do, you know, typhoons come through Philippines often. It just didn't happen for the first time. Earthquakes happen in San Francisco very often. What are we learning from past events that we can do better? Disaster preparedness is not just about the government. It is about the people. And people are best prepared when all sectors work together. Ryan Macasero, Rappler, Manila. Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych agrees to an early presidential election in an effort to end a bloody crisis. He also says he agreed to a national unity government and constitutional changes that will reduce the president's power. Yanukovych earlier announced the government reached a deal after hours of negotiations with the opposition and the foreign ministers of Germany, France and Poland. The top three opposition leaders have not yet released comments. The death toll from the crisis rises Thursday after dozens of people are killed in violent clashes between protesters and police in the capital, Kiev. China urges U.S. President Barack Obama to cancel a planned meeting with exiled Tibetan spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. China's foreign ministry spokeswoman, Hua Xunying, asks the U.S. to, quote, treat China's concern in a serious way. China calls the Dalai Lama a wolf in sheep's clothing and accuses him of seeking independence for Tibet. Hua adds, the U.S. leaders meeting with the Dalai will seriously impair China-U.S. relations. Obama last met with the Dalai Lama at the White House in 2011 in a meeting that angered Beijing. Let's now look at Rappler's Rap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number seven, North and South Korean family members divided by the Korean War reunite with their relatives after 60 long years of separation. It is a tearful reunion for divided families. Many bring old and new photographs to share with their long-lost relatives. The gathering at North Korea's Mount Kumgang Resort is a result of high-level negotiations between Pyongyang and Seoul. At number eight, more hospitals are starting to embrace social media. The Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Canada live tweets the four-hour bypass surgery of a 57-year-old man in an effort to educate the public about cardiac disease and the importance of heart health. Live updates on medical procedure was pioneered by a medical center in the United States in 2012, which live tweeted an open heart surgery and a brain operation. And at number nine, the Pew Research Center comes up with a remittance map that shows how much countries sent or received from the others in 2012. International migrants sent $529 billion in remittances back to their home countries, with the United States as the top sender and India as the top receiver. The data shows $610 million in remittances were sent from the Philippines to other countries in 2012. For the full top 10, visit Rappler.com's The Wrap. 
Every Story Unraveler has a mood meter, which gives you eight emotions to choose from. Click how you feel and your vote comes down to the mood navigator in the middle of the front page. That crowdsources the mood of the day. It also gives you the top 10 stories that have affected our readers and our viewers the most in the last 24 hours. These 10 stories have gotten the most number of votes on their mood meter. If you take a look, um, we've got the Abu Sayyaf Freeze, Filmmakers in Sulu, 92% happy, 4% angry, and uh, the story that, that keeps coming back in the last few days, PMA Cadet Fights Back, Gets Support, 17% um, happy, 63% angry, and 3% inspired. That story bringing out this, the story that's gotten the most number of votes, which actually is not a story from today, but related to the PMA cadet. This is the PMA valedictorian earlier this year from coconut farmer to PMA valedictorian. I'm sorry, this is from last year. And now it's the top story. You see an interesting 16% happy, 78% inspired. That circle, that color bringing out the mood of the day. Today, it is Friday. Most people are inspired. That is Rappler's newscast for today, Friday, February 21, 2014. Visit Rappler.com and watch our newscast Monday to Friday. Tell us how you feel on our mood meter and help us crowdsource the mood of the day. I'm Maria Ressa. As we say at Rappler, tomorrow begins today.